This meeting is being recorded. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and start. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're all here. My name's uh, Karen Dyke, and I am part of Longmont Climate Community. We're a fairly new organization, but tonight's um, presentation is from Longmont Climate Community. Other members of that group that are on the call are Lynette, Mitzi, Michael, and Judith, and you will see them uh, throughout the program. Tonight is part four of what's in our air. And we're gonna take uh, a little, little trip down to another community that's really being affected by pollution from the fossil fuel industry. And then um, I wanna remind you that at the end of, um, of the, well, my screen's, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, my screen's flipping around here. Uh, we will end with the question and answer section. So please put any questions you have in the chat uh, section in the chat window. And then uh, Judith and Michael will be picking those up uh, before we do that final panel. As we start tonight, we need to realize that um, air pollution doesn't just occur at the point of extraction, but also it leaks from pipelines and from refineries. And then of course, into our homes, we have natural gas stoves. We hope that information from tonight's session will give us ideas for our own work on air pollution. But as we do this, we also need to remember that air circulates freely throughout the Northern Front Range and air from that refinery doesn't stay in Adams County. So we're gonna talk about Cultivando. It's an organization centered in Commerce City and there is a frontline community there severely affected by the fossil fuel industry. That refinery is called Suncor. And I know whenever I'm driving on that um, I-76 or 270, I always make sure my air vents are closed so that that bad air doesn't get into my car. And so uh, this is, the, this is the, the people that reside in that bad air. So we're gonna start with the film clip. It's about nine minutes. And um, it will give you a real sense of what they're doing. So I'm gonna share my screen. Take me just one second here to get it started. I reside in what we now call um, Commerce City, Colorado, which is really the homeland of the You know, I, I think I might have lost the sound when I muted myself. Can you hear now? Yeah. I reside in what we now call uh, Commerce City, Colorado, which is really the homelands of the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Lakota, the Kiowa, the Chicano, and 48 tribes that still live and travel through these species. Ancestrally, a space that respected that it had certain sources of life and you had to respect the region for what it, what it honored and what it offered and the indigenous people did. They want all of the resource with none of the responsibility of restoring the source of life that they're taking. That is where I have grown up my entire life, where I have practiced our traditional ways of life. I think a lot about Suncor 
being right next to the Platte River, those very same waters are right next asking my grandparents about it when they would take us to school because we would pass by it every single day you know they didn't seem like it was that big of a deal and we started to see um, the effects on my grandparents land my grandparents would wake up in the morning and they would have this film um, that's on their cars and since then it's only gotten worse and that film is like a yellowish type of color and you can see some of that yellow smoke you know I, I've been driving down the street and been able to see it. I think about all the teenagers who have to go back inside because the air quality is too bad for them to play out or to ride their bikes. My mother um, has an autoimmune disease, which now I have also um, developed as well. Families who've lived here for you know decades who are reporting that their children are having a hard time breathing, concentrating, having nosebleeds and things like that. I don't think they understand how uh, they've affected our, our air and our water, um, and nor do I think that they care. children had to shelter in place at school in December because of a large yellow plume of ash released by Suncor. Because they come from a space that they can take the resource without ever restoring the space. A life giver understands the rebalance of taking part of that resource for balance, but mostly restoring the space when you're in there so that resource can continue. It's supposed to be sustainable. Because it is so close, you know, and because they don't always disclose what's in the air, you know, what's being emitted, uh, we don't really know how it's going to affect us. Vea, tengo tantos años aquí en Comer City y no nos mandan flyers, pero en sí, en sí especificando el por qué y qué debemos evitar, no lo tenemos. Muchas veces me ha amanecido mi camioneta con un color amarillento muy feo en, en mi vidrio. We remember a couple of years back when there was this thick yellow dust that was everywhere. It was on our cars, it was on our windows, um, and Suncor just apologized and said they would offer some car washes. Oh, tengo otras conocidas que me dicen que sus hijos padecían de mucho sangrado, y con el tiempo el doctor les fue diciendo que quizás era por el medio ambiente. Entonces también mis hijos pasan mucho de eso. Y pues a veces no sabíamos pues por qué, hasta que vas investigando y vas sabiendo, entonces pues tiene que ver como pues, la, en la contaminación en la que vivimos. A lot of the people in my house, you know, they get migraines. Personas que conozco por lo menos tienen a alguien en su familia con asma. Those are some of the things that have been reported by a lot of people in these neighborhoods, right? And they've been allowed to do that for only economic benefit. Well, they have literally diminished the quality and health and safety benefit of everything. The quality of soil, air, land, and the people. Mi marido tiene viviendo 40 años en la misma casa. Entonces hay raíces porque sus hijos mayores que sean aquí. When we take care of the earth, the air, the water, we also take care of ourselves and our family, our descendants and our ancestors. Yeah, so of course, just uh, on the other side of all those trees, you know, you can even see it flickering right now. 
it's all right there, you know, in our backyard. To me, a good neighbor is someone that I can trust next to me. Good neighbors are there to, to love you and your community just like you love them. You share that space. That is not a neighbor. That's a monster. It's killing our children. We are not only able to speak up, but that people are willing to listen and that there's going to be change. This wouldn't fly in an affluent community. This wouldn't fly in a predominantly white community. Because no matter what the state accuses that Commerce City refinery of, it doesn't seem like anything ever changes. To outsiders, it's alarming. Uh, but to people who live near Santa Cruz, it's just another day in the shadow of a seemingly untouchable giant. Eh, me entristece más que nada por el hecho de que cuando yo supe que eran ellos mismos los que se regulaban, eh, me entristeció mucho porque sentí que no les importamos como 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 personas, como seres humanos. Now that we know that this is happening to more of us, then we feel like the strength of the community, the strength in numbers. And so our community is very ready now to make sure that Suncor is held accountable. Cultivando is an environmental and civil justice organization chosen to set up new air monitoring devices around the refinery and nearby neighborhood. Our monitors will measure up to 50 toxics, including radioactive matter. The information that will be picked up from these monitors will then be fed into a bilingual website which we will also be creating and we'll list all the toxics that have been detected by the monitors as well as the associated health conditions that are tied to those. The people who have to live around an industrial zone are the low-income families, are my people. You know, if not enough people are speaking up and, and trying to advocate for our communities and that's when we have to step in. Estamos aquí, somos vecinos, somos comunidad y que pues no es justo que nos esté perjudicando de esa manera. What's at stake right now is our future generations. It's their air, it's their water, um, it's their life that we're fighting for at the end of the day. Prepare yourselves for the challenges of the climate impacts that are already going to happen. I'm trying to teach them some form of sustainability because I know that they're going to have a harder fight than I did. Don't be afraid. I have watched this several times, and every time I watch it, my it just hope right is that more people will join the cause. If they continue business as usual, we will be choked out and flushed out of our homelands. That's just what's going to happen. Now I think it's the end. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to into the video there um, but every time I watch this I uh, think about how awful it must be to live in um, in that pollution it's hard enough just knowing we're here downstream from the fracking and know that we have benzene and toluene that's really uh, awful I forgot to uh, mention at the beginning that um, this video, along with uh, the th first three presentations, can be found on Longmont Public Media and also on our new website, Longmont uh, Climate Community. And um, it's also on YouTube if you want to um, look, go out on YouTube. And I'm going to share a different um, different presentation now. And I'm going to introduce Phil Doe. I've known Phil Doe for a long time, and he's here to give us uh, information on that project involving Cultivando. Um, a representative from that community, Olga, uh, we invited her tonight and she couldn't join us. So thank you, Phil, for stepping up. Phil Doe was the environmental direct director of Be the Change Colorado. Formerly, he headed the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation's policy office for the regu regulation of federally developed Western water. 
He was also a federal whistleblower on 60 Minutes. He's written many articles on environmental issues and Colorado politics for the online magazine Counterpunch. Phil. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, let's, uh, let's go to the first slide, would you please? Brand new details for you tonight on the power failure at the Suncor refinery that sent that orange smoke billowing into the air two weeks ago. Take a look at that. Pretty scary, right? The company officials, though, they acknowledged the accident released over 75,000 pounds of sulfur dioxide right there into the air. That's 150 times more than the daily limit. But state officials say the release did not pose any health risk. Okay. Next slide, please, Karen. <clears throat> Great. I wanted, there we go. There you go. <laughs> we, got we, we got it, Karen. We're just it takes a, a village. It takes a village. You know, the only thing I can do with my hands is use my toothbrush. But so um, let's talk a little bit about who Suncor is. They're the second largest corporation in Canada. Uh, their chief source of profit is the mining of tar sands. They're the largest tar sands miner in the world. And as you know, James Hansen said, if they develop all the tar sands in Alberta, game over. Now, as for the refinery itself, it started back in 1940, maybe even a little earlier. It's gone through numerous changes. Suncor bought it in 2003 and 2000 prime from Conoco and uh, Valero, respectively. It produces about 100,000 barrels of, of oil and gas a day. Most of the jet fuel at DIA comes from Suncor. Most of the asphalt used in the state comes from Suncor. About 55% of the diesel in the state comes from Suncor. 35% of the gasoline. Uh, tar sands from Alberta, 1,200 miles away, makes up 15% of the production. When, when, Suncor, when Suncor bought the Conoco and Valero uh, refineries, they paid about $200 million for both of them. They spent, according to them, about $400 million upgrading the refinery. But I think most of that money was spent on bringing a pipeline from uh, Canada down to the Suncor refinery. So that's how they got the tar sands down there. The dirtiest fossil fuel there is. OK, next slide, uh, Karen, please. Uh, what is the Cultivando project? Well, one thing it is is the continuous monitoring, first time ever, of Suncor air pollution. One thing you have to understand about oil and gas development in this state and throughout the United States is oil and gas monitor itself. The state does not monitor. It's been said that self-regulation is to regulation as self-importance is to importance. Once you add self as a modifier, the world changes completely. And that's what happens at Suncor. You have no idea what's going on out there. But let me tell you some of the chemicals we were concerned about when we started developing this project plan. I don't have greenhouse gases there, but I'll just say a word about that. Suncor has a permit to emit 800,000 tons of greenhouse gases a year. That's CO2 and methane. It's hard to explain how great that volume is. But um, I used to say that, well, the static weight of the Empire State Building is 346,000 tons, and it weighs, <laughs> it's almost over two times that. But that's, those are apples and oranges. What you can say is that in 2019, 188,000 cars were bought new in the state of Colorado. The tailpipe emissions from all of those 188,000 cars is about equal to what Suncor does. It's supposed to be the second largest polluter in the state, Comanche 3 being first, but Comanche 3 doesn't operate very often. So I think that Suncor is probably, from a greenhouse gas standpoint and from other pollutants, probably the largest emitter in the state. Benzene, uh, the World Health Organization says there's no safe limit for human humans around benzene, yet Suncor has a nine parts per billion permit. It exceeds that, as the, as the slide showed you, as Coltivano's uh, slide presentation or movie presentation showed you, they exceed it all the time. 2012, they got a $2 million fine. They've had other fines. Um, EPA estimates that they probably reached two tons of benzene a year. 
Hydrogen cyanide was developed as a pesticide. It was used in the First World War as a poison gas in the trenches, first used by the French, it was later used by the Nazis, of course, in the extermination camps such as Treblinka in the Second World War. Suncor has had a tremendous problem controlling its cyanide, hydrogen cyanide releases. It started out a few years ago about 10 tons and it kept going up and going up and going up because it's not, it's, there, there's not a standard for it under the Clean Air Act. They ask and the state gives them approval, but it finally got up, they asked for 20 tons a year and all hell broke loose. And the people in, around um, in Commerce City, around the Sun Commerce Valley, what the hell's going on here? And that's where the whole, that's when the whole issue of these two pollution permits, which have been expired, one for over a decade, started to surface. And people started to learn that they weren't, they weren't giving these health, they weren't giving these permits for pollution based on any health considerations, but what they could do under the Clean Air Act. Uh, Suncor also uh, re, uh, releases about 12 tons, tons of hydrogen sulfide, which is another gas poison, which the British used in the First World War. Start getting a picture here of this place is just a little house of horrors. And the sulfur dioxide, of course, is what everybody sees. That's what you see in that slide below. And this, you know, they, they've had huge sulfur di dioxide releases over time. The one that, sh that uh, they showed in the Cultivano film in 2016, they have a permit for 500 pounds a day. They released 75,000 pounds. It closed down an interstate highway. All the schools were locked in. They had to do a reverse 9-11 for all the houses within a two mile range of the Suncor plant. It happened again in 2018. This time there were these, these uh, uh, pellets of uh, clay that came with it. It covered the entire area, all the cars. But once again, Suncor said, no problem. State agreed. But they did warn the people that they should wash their clothes right away and take a shower. And they said, well, if, and as they said, the film, uh, we'll, we'll wash your cars for you too. And then there's particulates. Not a very sexy subject, I suppose, but it's what we would call soot. But it's giving a lot more attention now. Suncor has a permit for 55 tons of particulates uh, a year. The EP estimates that that's been probably underestimated by many, many, many times. But since nobody regulates and nobody monitors except Suncor itself, it's hard to ascertain. One thing we do know, the particulates have a tremendous impact on public health. Uh, the National Academy of Science uh, recently said that about 63% of all environmental deaths result from particulates from fossil fuels. 3% of all deaths in the United States result from particulates from fossil fuels. And then there's a new study out from Harvard saying that of 9, the 9 million premature deaths in the world, the 9 million deaths, a substantial proportion of them, about 60%, are from particulates from fossil fuels. I mean, it's, it's a, a, you know, becoming a major, major problem. Add to this that a Harvard study on radioactive uh, pollution shows that from well sites, downwind from well sites, increases in radioactive toxins increased substantially, up to 40% ab above background. And that those, those particulates, those toxins are carried by particulates and can be measured 12 miles downstream from the actual source. And finally, there's a very recent article out of the Journal for the National Cancer Institute, which says that within five or 10 miles of a refinery, the chances of contracting one, one form of cancer or another go up exponentially. So would you go to the next slide? Um, this is, this is Denver. and five mile radius that the area inside that circumference is home to 120,000 people. But it also includes downtown Denver where people don't live. So the impact is actually much greater, but look what it includes. I mean, you, you know, <laughs> 
it, it includes the downtown, the major hospitals in the, in the metropolitan area include National Jewish. And if you go out to the 10 mile uh, radius, it includes a population of all 875,000 people that are being potentially injured with increased can uh, chances of cancer from the Suncor refinery. You know, it includes the Denver Country Club. I, I like to say that, well, the only, the only thing that the people at Denver Country Club and the people around Suncor have in common is the fact that they're all, all being, their chances of getting in cancer are a lot greater. Uh, as the film shows, the people around Suncor are about 75% Latino and about 55% live below the poverty line. And, you know, I think the poverty line in the United States is still $12,000 $12, for a single person and $22,000 for a family of three. Think about that. They have to look, they live that way and then they have the Suncor refinery right at the back. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Cult of Bottle will manage the project and is managing it. Uh, Detlef will do the bold, is, you know, Boulder Air will do the data collection. Uh, and these are some of the people that will, um, will do the health and, and um, sociological studies. On the right there at the top, the man with the gray hair is Dr. Brown. He was the head of the uh, Connecticut Department of Public Health. He was an associate director for the CDC in Atlanta on toxicity, on toxicology. He taught toxicology at, at uh, Northeastern University in Boston and got his PhD or his doctor of science from Harvard College in toxicology. Down at the bottom left, is Willa Sumra, Supra. Uh, she's from Louisiana. Uh, she's served on the EPA National Science Advisory Council, co-chaired them for years and years and years. She won a MacArthur um, Genius Award for her work helping small communities understand the impacts of oil and gas development and refineries on their communities. The middle two women are Ramona Beltran, uh, she teaches sociology at DU. And of course, some of you may, may recognize Stephanie Malin. They will be doing the, so they, the sociological and psychological impacts of Suncor on, on the people's lives living around uh, the, the refinery. And the, the psychological effect is, it can be devastating. I mean, as you, as you recognize now with the, the impact that the pandemic has had on kids, the psychological impact. At the bottom, I'll, I'll skip the fellow over there with the mask. I think I recognize him. But the guy at the bottom, the bottom right, is Mike Wireman. He's a friend of Wes and I. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, a hydrogeologist at EPA and recognized as a national uh, expert on groundwater. I haven't mentioned this, but part of the study will include PFAS. And Mike will do a literature search and review of what PFAS information is available about Suncor and the surrounding. Suncor has a tremendous problem there. Uh, they have monitoring wells um, at the plant and they've, sh they've showed up PFAS about 190 times above the safe, safe health standards EPA has established. Plus they discharge about 3.5 million gallons of water a day into Sand, Sand Creek, which runs into the Platte River. And that is probably a good avenue of escape for PFAS as well. He will be looking at those, um, those pathways and be writing a report on. The final report on the health impacts will be written by Dr. Brown. Wilma will be the go-to person for um, Cultivando when, when the data that left develops, uh, looks like it sh there should be alert put out to the people about what's going on. And uh, the study from these two women will probably be later than, um, than the rest of the report was put out. Okay, can the next slide. Uh, it costs about $1.7 million. It's in two components. A debt lift data gathering is one component and the health and social impact uh, components and Colty Bono's uh, community involvement are the, are the other component. Uh, next slide. It's a one year beginning in January of 2022. Uh, we'd like to extend it. 
I mean, it's the only study of its kind. And I think that um, money should be made out of the APC's bud APCD's budget to allow this study to continue until we get enough information to make a decision. Now, one of the things that's complicating this whole business is that the APCD within the CDPHE, within the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, claims that SB 181 doesn't apply to it. So it doesn't have to evaluate these, these pollutants as to their impact on public health. That's their claim. That's gonna be a big fight. We've been at it for a long time now and it's gotta to come to an end here soon. Next slide, please. Uh, this is shameless. I, I've written three articles on the Cultivando situation. Um, and I'm just listing them here. Uh, the last one, one of the, how much time do I have, Karen? Oh, you have uh, about five minutes yet. Okay, yeah. one of the things, the reason we got involved with Colty Bondo on this was that when the state fined Suncor $9 million, they set aside $2.7 million or $2.9 million for citizen uh, projects. The interesting part was that the citizens were going to decide how that money was going to be spent. We would have never gotten involved in this if the state was going to do it. So, we, you know, we helped Culty Bondo put together the project. When we got to the voting, guess who was, who was voting? The state and, and Suncor, and they both voted against this project. <laughs> and I write about that. I, I, was, I was so infuriated by that, I could not believe it. But the citizens finally prevailed, and we did get funding for both parts of the project. Uh, this this one down here that the more than two dozen major lawsuits it's kind of interesting because as, as you read in the paper recently uh, Boulder County is suing both Suncor and, and uh, uh, Exxon Mobil uh, over the climate climate disruption it'll be interesting to follow but we can't wait for that we've got to get Suncor either closed down and I think that's probably the only real option or it's got to quit killing people slowly or quickly as it's doing now. Uh, the, a lot of the information that I talked about in this came out of this, the way things are in Colorado, the Latino led effort to uh, change things, uh, which was March of 20. You can, those are all available online. In the last slide, I think it's the last slide. Um, I just, these are some of the people that supported our effort. Uh, there were a lot more that wrote in but these were the ones that we had on, uh, had captured by the time we submitted our, uh, our proposal. Uh, Richard Lamb was always up front. Uh, we became fairly good friends. He, he always supported everything we wanted to do about climate and fracking. Uh, he was one of the first to sign on on this and he actually went out and tried to get other, <laughs> other past governors to sign on, one living north of you and no luck. But, I'm going to miss him. He was a good guy, I thought. And so there you, there you have it. That's, that's the background on what Culty Bondo is going to do about with Suncor. Great. Oh, thank you, Phil. Lots and lots of information. So a reminder that you'll be able to go back to, um, um, to our website or Long Rock Public Media, and uh, you'll have time to, to um, copy all those journal articles. Mitzi is going to take over here. Yes, good evening. My name is Mitzi Nicoletti. Our next two speakers, Dr. Detlev Helmig and Andrew Kuster, will discuss their findings at the Suncor site. Our first speaker, Dr. Detlev Helmig, received his university education and PhD degree in Germany. He moved to the U.S. where he held appointments at the statewide Air Pollution Center, University of California, Riverside, and the National Center of Atmospheric Research in Boulder. Over the past five years, Dr. Helmig's research has shifted towards the study of air quality here in Colorado. He is the lead scientist for community monitoring with stations in Boulder, Longmont, Erie, and Broomfield, and now is adding the Suncor site. Detlev, would you like to give us an uh, update on the Suncor site? Yes, thank you, Mitzi, and um, good
Good evening, everybody. Good to be here again. Um, is that screen sharing working? Can you see my presentation slide? Yes. Good, good. Okay, I want to give you um, an update where things stand with the implementation of an air monitoring program in Commerce City. And I have first shot a few data plots to share with you as well, but want to emphasize this all very, very fresh, very new, and still part of the preliminary. So, yep. So um, probably most of you have seen this in the past. This is what we've been um, developing the last four or five years, a network of air monitoring stations here in um, the Colorado Front Range. Um, these are the existing operating sites um, shown data and presented this many, many times. So what's new, bottom right here, so we've been adding two new locations to um, this network, um, two sites in Commerce City, and we've named those um, Commerce City Fixed Site, CCF, and Commerce City Mobile Site, CCM, and I will um, show you now what we're monitoring and where things stand with um, setting these sites up. So in this table here, um, the left column shows the measurements that are planned for the um, fixed site location, again, CCF. Um, let me walk you through this. It's a very um, um, long list and I would um, claim, as far as I know, this is probably the most comprehensive air quality monitoring in the state um, that's ever been done as far as I know. So the um, fixed sites on the left has the meteorology, we're measuring ozone, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, uh, methane, volatile organic compounds, and that includes many, many compounds, and I've only listed two here individual, Individually, that's benzene and hydrogen cyanide. And we heard about those compounds in the previous talks. And we are, will monitor particulate matter, coarse particulates, PM10, and fine particulates, PM2.5. And then really for the first time um, in this capacity, we'll be monitoring the radioactivity. And rather than doing long-term averaged um, filter samples, we will be measuring those in real time um, at high time resolution, which is really a high, high advantage over um, long time integrated measurements. Then we have a mobile um, facility that has a smaller um, selection of measurements here, meteorology, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and again, VOCs. And then it has a community monitoring program. Um, I will show you in a moment um, what that entails. Um, but let's look at the, um, the, the trailer facilities first. The fixed site you can see in this picture here, it was installed in late November. It's north of um, Suncor and that houses all these measurements that were left um, listed in the left column. Um, the mobile trailer is a little bit smaller. Um, since it has a, a fewer instruments, it's also deployed um, as of right now in Commerce City. And this is, um, these are the components of the community monitoring. So these are air monitors, samplers that are placed um, at community sites across the area. And there are three components that are these small purple air particulate monitors, which you see in the left picture. Then um, we will deploy these um, passive samplers for volatile organic compounds. It's shown in the middle. And on the right, this shows these canisters, these, these round steel canisters. And they're also used to sample air when there are occurrences of poor air quality. We will give those to citizens so they can um, open these canisters um, and they will then suck in air and close the valve. And we will then analyze those for volatile organic compounds in one of our laboratory trailers. This shows where these are currently deployed in the very center there, kind of this little picture is roughly where the Sanko refinery is located. Straight to the north is this, this fixed side and the yellow dot, the mobile trailer, it will move around about every two weeks. It's currently um, 
a little bit to the northeast of the Sanco refinery. And then these um, purple air um, particle sensors, we have more than 20 of those installed right now. And you can see how they are distributed at all of these um, purple dot locations. Um, again, I want to show you um, a little bit more where the fixed side, our central side is located, um, that, that brownish trailer. And you can see it's a pretty sh straight shot from the refinery to the north, maybe um, less than a mile, half a mile. And we, we look very, very hard for a long time to find a suitable location, trying to find one that was in a, in a straight airflow without any other interfering potential sources in between. Um, that's the best we could come up with. And it's been there for two months and measurements are currently ramping up. This is a status report where things stand as of right now. Um, the deep green color show monitoring that's up and running, fully uh, quality controlled. The lighter blue, these are measurements ongoing. We're still um, working on some of the calibration. Um, procedures for those measurements. Um, the other ones are in preparation. At the fixed side, the VOC instrument was just made operational the last two days. We um, anticipate this will go online in the next week or two. The particulate monitor just um, was shipped today, should go online in the next few days. The radioactivity measurements, it's an instrument uh, which was ordered in December and is anticipated to arrive in, in April. Um, the, the mobile trailer is up and running with VOCs. Um, we're just not reporting them yet to the website. Um, the particulate measurements on the purple airs are running and the passive samplers for the VOCs and the canisters we accept to um, start in uh, March. We've also developed a web portal where these um, data are being reported. The site is up and running. You can see the URL here in the title. It reports current air quality conditions in this um, very simple, um, simply designed <coughs> color scheme to report air quality in, in green, yellow, orange, red, and so forth. You see the scale there. And then below is um, other data in tabulated format. Um, and there's also another tab um, where you can see the data plotted as time series, we call these. This is the last three days of data. Uh, you're probably familiar with this by now since the other sites have a very, very similar format. And you can see this actually data all the way through today for three of the gases, pollutants that we're measuring at the um, Commerce City fixed site, ozone, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Um, another component of the project is dispersion modeling. What we're doing here is we're taking inventory emissions. So these are not our own measurements. These are inventory emissions, what's um, reported to be emitted from the refinery. And we uh, apply those emissions to a dispersion model that then projects where downwind these emissions um, end up and how they are distributed at the surface. So here you can see one example from an episode in January when we had a strong inversion and we had winds from the um, Southeast. You can see the emissions being transported to the Northwest of the refinery. Um, this is making good progress, but it's not posted in real time on the website yet. Um, We've also included the observations from the fixed side in our data analysis tool that's public online. So you can, as of right now, access this tool. And if you look here at the very bottom, um, CCF Commerce City fixed site, the data are in this tool. You can select it, you can select the species, you can select the, the time window and um, visualize data from any um, period where they are available um, to date. I'm going to give you some first, very first example. This is just the last 10 days. Um, methane measurements from the Commerce City location. And here they are in this darker blue, the darker blue, um, compared to measurements at the Boulder Reservoir, in Erie, and in Longmont. 
Um, so you can see, you know, we have um, episodes where the Commerce City data are elevated um, above these other locations. But, you know, we also had spikes here in Longmont that were pretty high for, for a few days. You can also see that, you know, there are times when they're low and the, all the sites are low. And that's mostly then when it gets really windy and the air gets pretty clean, you know, all across the front range. You could see this um, even down at Commerce City. Um, where levels drop to uh, much lower levels. So this is methane, nitrogen oxides. Um, over the, since we've been running this for the last two months, on average, we see higher levels of nitrogen oxides in the Commerce City site and at all the other locations. So you can see the dark blue um, has most of the, the higher spikes um, um, compared to the other locations. Um, this is what's been striking the most thus far. Um, these are measuring, measurements of hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen sulfide is this, this smelly sulfury compound. You know, when you go to Yellowstone, you smell some of that, and also sulfur dioxide. You can smell it at landfills, and, and mostly where there's rotting material or there's, 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 there's geologic gases um, coming to the surface. Um, we're measuring this only at two sites in the network. The other comparison site is in Broomfield. That's the um, um, Soaring Eagle location in Broomfield, which is here comparison in, in green. And you can see clearly how the Commerce City location is so much more elevated in the um, hydrogen sulfide. The odor threshold varies um, among people. Um, I've seen uh, odor thresholds reported as low as nine, 10 parts per billion. So you can see we have quite a number of spikes here where you would expect that this um, will be noticed, recognized by people um, being in that area. And these levels are clearly exceeding um, odor thresholds values. And we've seen this, this, this many, many, many times. Um, when we look at this hydrogen sulfide data, um, um, and do this correlation with wind direction, we see a very clear pattern where the elevated levels of hydrogen sulfide are correlated with winds from the west and the south. So these are wind roses where the length of these, these pi segments show you how frequent the winds are from a certain direction. And when we saw this, we were very happy um, because you see most times the winds are from the south or the southwest and we are located north of the refinery. So we are downwind, which is where we want it to be. So we're in the right place. And you can see that um, um, there's much more red in the flows from the south, but also specific, specifically from the southwest. If you then plug this into the model and put this on, on the map, um, this is what we've gotten so far, and this is um, just for three weeks of observations in January. You can see very, very nicely how um, when the winds come from the, the north, the east, or the southeast, the levels are much, much lower. So the blue colors are for, for lower levels um, of hydrogen sulfide, and that, the, um, that there's a very distinct narrow um, section from where the um, hydrogen sulfide appears to originate. Uh, but now you have to remember that um, um, the winds don't really come that frequently from the west. You know, they come much more frequent from the south. But when they come from the west or the southwest, we see these, these much darker colors, redder colors. So there's much higher distribution of higher concentrations with hydrogen sulfide from that segment. And then when you combine those now, you, so you multiply the frequency of the winds with what you see in levels that's coming from those directions. It looks a little bit different, um, but you get a similar story. You know, most of that hydrogen sulfide comes from the um, southwest quadrant. Um, air coming from the north is much, much cleaner, much, much lower. Air coming from the southeast doesn't have much. So, you know, we're starting to see some dependencies where um, using this, this high um, um, time resolved data and collating it with the, with the winds, we can get a first few insights, you know, where some of the pollutants that we see here are originated. So, and this is just a very first. Um, glimpse 
of um, what we'll be doing the next year and where things stand at this point. And as I said, we're, we're still ramping up. And I think within the next month or two, um, we'll pretty much be um, fully up and running. And with that, I'll turn this back to Mitzi. Um, Thank you, Detlev. Andrew is next, if I remember right. Yes, thank you, Dale. That was excellent. So our, our next speaker is Andrew Kluster. He is a Colorado field advocate at Earthworks. He is passionate about environmental justice and community organizing and is determined to apply that passion to the critical work in Colorado of ensuring that the state and local governments are prioritizing public health, the environment, and future Coloradans over resource extraction. Andrew. Thank you. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I just have a video, a single video to share with you all today. Um, but before I, before I start playing the video, and you can all see my screen, correct? Yes. Cool. Before I start playing the video, I did just want to say um, a little bit in case there's a few folks on here who haven't seen me present on one of these webinars in the past. Um, as an employee with Earthworks, I'm a certified optical gas imaging thermographer, which is quite a bit of a mouthful, but essentially what that means is I am trained to use and operate optical gas imaging cameras or OGI cameras. And these are specially designed infrared cameras that allow us to visualize pollutants that are otherwise invisible to the naked eye. And the camera model that we at Earthworks use and I use when I'm conducting field work for Earthworks is the same model that the oil and gas industry employs for leak detection and repair, because this is a camera that allows us to see methane, which is invisible to the naked eye. And as I think we all know, is a major greenhouse gas and a major pollutant from the oil and gas industry. And it also allows us to see other hydrocarbons, including volatile organic compounds, such as benzene, which um, Phil, I think, did a really good job of framing for us as to why we should be concerned about benzene emissions. And so one last note before I start playing this video, and I'll talk over the video in the interest of time, but typically when I do field work um, and when Earthworks conducts field work, we're looking at upstream facilities. So well sites, well pads, infrastructure that's associated with oil and gas extraction. Um, we don't as frequently film um, gas plants and refineries. And part of the reason is because one of the things that we do with our field work is we try to hold operators accountable um, to what they may be getting away with. And we try to hold uh, state regulators such as at the Air Pollution Control Division accountable for the regulations that they may be enforcing or may not be enforcing. When it comes to refineries, as Phil mentioned um, in his presentation, they kind of operate under a completely different regulatory framework than well facilities and well pads. And so um, this video here that you're gonna see, um, I, was, I, I was approached by both Boulder Air and Cultivando last year, and this was filmed in December of last year. And we're really, we're thinking of this as just a sort of complement, visual complement to the data that Detlev is collecting and to the rest of the data that's gonna be gathered by this project. And I plan to take subsequent videos, but um, we won't be following through with our traditional earthworks process of filing complaints via these videos or anything like that, unless um, something really, really stands out. But again, you know, as Phil discussed, these refineries, even when they are operating under a permit, which Suncor has not been, they are permitted to pollute, um, pump tons and tons of pollutants into the atmosphere, um, and which is a problem in and of itself. But I'm going to start the video now, and I will, like I said, I'll provide some commentary as it plays um, in the interest of time, because I know we have some more speakers to get to. Um, but you'll see as this video starts, we'll start with just a digital camera photo. Um, and it, as it zooms in, it's going to transition to the OGI footage. And you can already notice immediately that what you're seeing via OGI is a lot more, there's just, it's a lot more busy than what you saw with that naked eye view. And the first thing that you'll see is a lot of these stacks on the refinery. You can see the uh, heat and steam coming out of the top of their stacks. But the more important thing to focus on, this stack in the middle of the video here, you see this tail, this trail of pollution that is, that is coming off of it and going off screen. That's the telltale sign of uh, emissions that are uncombusted coming from that stack. So again, our camera visualizes hydrocarbons, methane, VOCs, those, whatever is coming out of the top of that stack is not being fully combusted. And therefore those pollutants are carrying off and away from the facility in this video. And again, you know, what we're, what we're hoping to achieve with these videos, um, and this is just the first pass, we, I plan to take some more of the refinery from potentially different angles. All of these were taken from across the Sand Creek um, as the easiest access we have. Um, so from the north. Um, 
what we hope to achieve is to be able to show people, show folks who are um, engaging with Cultivando's project, first of all, where, where the sources of emissions potentially are on the refinery, and also just to get a sense to start to understand, conceptualize how this pollution is traveling away from the facility. Uh, you know, this is not localized. When there's uncombusted emissions coming from these stacks, um, they're traveling far away from the facility before they settle over the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, so again, in this, this other clip, you see some of these stacks and you see that telltale sign of um, pollutants that are trailing away from the tips of the stacks there. And I think the video is just about over. Um, but as I said, this is a first pass. This is the first edited video we've thrown together. We plan on over the course of the year um, taking additional videos and continuing to complement um, all of the data, air quality data that DETLEV is collecting and Boulder is collecting. And we'll probably have much more to share in the future. Andrew, thank you. We look forward to seeing more footage this year. Um, it's alarming what we're looking at, but thank you for being here tonight. And now what we're gonna do is move on to the next portion of the webinar, which is our panel discussion. If you have any questions for panelists, please put them in the chat box. Andrew Kloster, Phil Doe, Dr. Detlev Helmig will be on the panel, but we're also gonna hear from Mike Foote, Jonathan Singer, and Mayor Joan Peck. Mike Foote, former Colorado legislator and current environmental energy attorney. Jonathan Singer, former Colorado legislator and current executive director of Logic. Joan Peck, longtime environmental activist and current mayor of Longmont. We're gonna ask each of these panel members to give us a quick summary of what they're currently working on and then we'll start our panel discussion. Mike, can you please start us off with an update? Yeah, happy to. Thanks a lot, Mitzi. And um, thanks to everyone for uh, joining us here tonight. Um, what I'm going to be talking about here for a few minutes, hopefully I'll make it a fairly quick summary, is about a recent report that I completed for the Sierra Club, the Colorado chapter of the Sierra Club, regarding the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and how it's been doing over the last year since their mission change rules went into effect. Um, so, you know, I'll, it, the, the report was extensive. Um, I am not gonna just put it up on the screen as a PowerPoint because you can read it yourself <laughs> if you haven't read it already. And um, also I'll put a uh, link in the chat here after this is all done so that you can take a look at it. But um, so, Basically, I was I was very happy to to help um, um, put this information together. Sierra Club wanted to know the answer to how things are going with the COGCC a year since the mission change rulemaking occurred, and the mission change rulemaking occurred um, a, uh, it, a, a pro actually it was about a year and a half after uh, Senate Bill 181 actually passed, and so it's been quite some time since the bill passed. But then when mission change went into effect. You have the new rules that went into effect January 15th of 2020, uh, 2021, I'm sorry. And they just wanted to know how it's going. And so I guess, you know, um, I'll summarize it this way. You know, like when you see on social media, you kind of have the split screen of, you know, it says how it started and then how it's going. <laughs> and, um, and, and so the way that I would summarize it, I guess, is if I had to put together a meme along those lines, I would start off with how it's going, which was the bill being passed, or you know, maybe a picture of the governor signing the bill back in April of 2019. And how it's going, I think I would probably put a picture of somebody, you know, hanging on to the edge of a cliff and um, uh, in danger but um, also not having lost hope. They haven't fallen off the cliff yet. Um, they can still get up off the cliff, but clearly that's kind of a perilous situation. And that's really how I would put how things are going with the COGCC now after observing it for a year and looking into the documents and um, really just trying to put pencil to paper to figure out exactly how the new commission has been implementing the law. Um, so there's going there's four areas that I'll just point out in particular in this little um, uh, summary. But of course, if you want more information, you can always go take a look at the report. Um, 
the, 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 the first area that I'll talk about very briefly is just kind of a general permitting philosophy. Um, I'll talk then about um, cumulative impacts and what they're doing or not doing with, with regards to accounting for cumulative impacts of oil and gas development. I'll talk about setbacks and what's happening there. And then finally, I'll talk about enforcement of rules or lack thereof, and um, just generally what the current commission is doing along all four of those lines. That's not, um, that, that doesn't cover everything that's in the report, but I think it's kind of the four maybe takeaway um, lines that you can take from it. So uh, number one, going to the general permitting philosophy. You know, the, 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 one of the main points of Senate Bill 181 was to change the permitting philosophy and the mission of the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Um, I think we know that the mission of the COGCC beforehand was a dual mission. It was to, um, uh, to basically, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were promoting the industry at the same time as they were regulating the industry, which is not really a, a very great um, mission there. And, and clearly, you know, during that point in time, they were doing much more to the promote the industry than to regulate the industry. The, the bill was intended to make sure that they were solely a regulatory uh, entity, that they were regulating the industry. And in that case, with permitting any new kind of, uh, of facilities, uh, what they were supposed to do is first and foremost, look at whether or not those new facilities would be um, protective of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife. So whether or not it was protective, it, under 181 is supposed to be their main inquiry. Um, what we're seeing instead of asking the basic question about what things, whether or not a particular new facility is pr protective, what we're seeing is they're kind of reverting back to the old check a box mentality, which is what they had before, which was here's our rules. And um, as long as the new permit checks all the boxes and uh, these new rules are met, then you're going to get your permit, regardless of whether or not it really is protective. Now the COGCC would claim their new rules are protective and that's what's protecting public health, safety, welfare, the environment and wildlife. Um, but um, it, I, you know, I think I disagree with that. I think a lot of probably everyone on this call disagrees with that, but the bottom line is they're not really even looking at it in a way that the bill really intended, which was the big picture of, is it protective or not? If it's not protective, the permit shall be denied. And that's just not the way they're looking at it right now, um, unfortunately. The uh, second quick takeaway that I'll talk about um, are setbacks. And this is kind of related to the general permitting part. But um, with setbacks, I think um, those of you that followed the mission change rulemaking um, know that, that the, the debate about setbacks was quite extensive. Ultimately, the rule that the COGC put into place was a presumptive 2,000 foot setback. However, there are exceptions to the 2,000 foot setback that can allow an operator to go as little as 500 feet away from a residence. And um, there's four exceptions to the 2,000 foot presumptive setback, uh, one of which has really turned out to be quite troubling, which is the exception that allows the operator to say, if they are putting into place conditions that or um, uh, provide substantially equivalent protections to if the facility was 2,000 feet away, they can go ahead and put the facility, say, 1,000 feet away or 750 feet away. So it's known as the substantially equivalent protections subsection. Um, that right now, at least based on what we've seen from the last year, has been an exception that has been ill-defined at the very least, but at worst, is an exception that threatens to swallow the entire rule and really become the rule. Um, we saw three new permit um, applications in 2021 that employed the substantially equivalent protections exception. There are a couple that are coming up here this, uh, this month, actually next week, that are even worse than the ones that we saw in 2021, one of which the Longs Peak OGDP um, uh, wants to place one of its pads 80, um, uh, within 2,000 feet of 87 residences at Firestone. And they're claiming that what they're putting into place is going to provide substantially equivalent protections to if the, if the facilities were placed 2,000 feet away. So 
This, as I said, is an exception that threatens to swallow the rule. We'll have to see what the COGCC does in particular with these new permits, uh, permit applications that are coming up here um, next week. The third thing I'll talk about very quickly is cumulative impacts. Um, you probably know that Senate Bill 181 put into place um, uh, a requirement for the COGCC to evaluate and address cumulative impacts of oil and gas operations. Um, so that's a two-part equation. You have to, first of all, evaluate what's happening and what kind of impacts or effects the oil and gas operations having on the environment, particularly those cumulative effects. But after you evaluate that, you're supposed to actually address those things. And um, in plain English, at least the way that I kind of see cumulative effects and cumulative impacts being is that it's really an analysis to ask, what is too much for an area? You know, I know most of this um, program has been about Commerce City. Of course, Commerce City already is struggling with all kinds of fossil fuel pollution, including the Suncor refinery. So in a place like Commerce City, if you put in three or four uh, or even as many as six new oil and gas developments, which is what actually one of the operators wants to do, you know, the cumulative impacts of that are going to be huge because of what they're already suffering. Um, less so perhaps in a place in rural Colorado, but that's debatable. And then that's even leaving outside the issue of climate and the effect on climate. But um, at any rate, the COGCC right now, even with the commissioner's own admission, has not really done much with cumulative impacts and implementing that part of 181. Um, they are doing stuff to gather the data, but they're not really doing anything with the data so far. And they have said that, um, so this is no surprise, but I still think it's worth mentioning because uh, again, it's been since 2019 since the bill's been in effect and we still don't have anything that's really truly addressing cumulative impacts, at least as envisioned under 181. Okay, so finally, I'll talk very briefly about enforcement. Um, and really what I wanna point out here is that um, there have been some enforcement measures taken over the last year since mission change that have um, been more robust. So, you know, I certainly want to acknowledge that. I, I call it in the report a two steps forward, one step back approach, um, because there have been some steps forward, but there's also been some steps backwards too like um, letting a, a major violator um, cut their fine down um, more than half that, that was assessed against them, for example. And also just the fact that there's still numerous, numerous complaints from residents that are close to existing oil and gas facilities, particularly along the lines of excessive noise and excessive emissions. Um, we see this in jurisdiction after jurisdiction. The facilities that they're complaining about are facilities that were permitted before Senate Bill 181. Um, but nevertheless, the rules that cover those facilities are, are in existence now after 181. And they're not sufficient enough to protect nearby residents against excessive noise and emissions, among other things. But noise and emissions are really the two main themes that we're seeing. So that still exists. That's still out there. That's still happening. It's still affecting people in a real way. And it just was something that I felt was important to point out in the report. So I guess I'll wrap it up there um, for now, unless there's any kind of Q&A or people want some further information about it. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I felt very uh, privileged to be able to work on to report. You know, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to pass any laws to do anything about it at this point. However, you know, folks can still go through the legislative process and, um, and try to get um, legislators to really address these types of things. It's not unusual to have a uh, quote unquote cleanup type of bill that's introduced after a major bill. Um, and to me, it seems like some of the provisions in 181 that are not really being implemented to kind of scream for a cleanup bill, <laughs> although it certainly won't be a simple cleanup bill. So I'll leave it at that. And again, thanks for your attention and thanks for having me on. And, look forward to any kind of questions you have about it. And in the meantime, I'll also put the link to the report um, in the chat box. Thank you, Mike. I encourage everybody to read that report. Um, and thank you for all the work you've done, Mike, on it. Next, uh, Jonathan, can you give us an update on what you're doing currently? 
I can. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you. Welcome to my basement. I'm glad we could fit all 44 of you in there. And I want to compliment all of you for actually uh, sitting in the same place for so long. Actually, your cameras are off, so I can't tell whether you've been sitting or jogging. So, <laughs> so this is what I'm going to do, actually. Um, and I'm going to take a little less time for myself and a little bit of time for, for all of us. Um, so I'm going to start talking uh, in about 30 seconds here, but I'm going to ask 10 people, at least 10 people, to um, turn their cameras on for a second because we're going to do something. And it's called chair yoga. Chair yes, because <laughs> if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. So we're not going to do all these exercises. I want everyone to pick one of these. I'm going to do the shoulder stretch because it looks the easiest, although after a night of drinking, if you look at the bottom right hand corner, maybe restore might be what what most of us <laughs> will look like. So, so, all right, we're going to take 30 seconds here. Um, pick an exercise. I'm going to do the shoulder stretch. Oh, I, I am actually wearing real pants today, but I'm still just doing the shoulder stretch. All right, I'm going to do one more because it turns out I'm in worse shape than I thought. So, all right. I'm gonna do one, one seated leg lift. Oh, I couldn't even do it. All right, well, all right. So now, now that, that thus concludes the, um, the healthy part of this, um, the, the exercise here today. So um, thank you all for, for indulging me on that, but trust me, it is good for you. Um, I hope you all signed a waiver before you did this in case anyone strained anything. So, um, Logic has been focused on both the state, the federal, and the local level. And the one thing that I wanted to share with you, and I don't think anyone has shared it yet, is the story map project that, uh, that has been put out with a conjunction of other environmental groups. So the story map project is something that's available to, to anyone. Um, and this identifies within the state of Colorado um, where our wells are, and whether these are high producing wells, low producing wells, uneconomic well, uneconomic wells, there we go. And um, so I'm gonna walk people through uh, just briefly what this is. So, um, so when we look at, at our map of Colorado here, we'll, we'll zoom in and enhance to Longmont, Boulder County, Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can pick any particular area here through the story map project and Logic will do a, we'll be doing an event where, where we'll do a full walkthrough of this. You can see who the applicant is or who the operator is um, and what they're doing. Why is this important? Well, as you can tell, you don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be certified in anything to see that the majority of wells in the state of Colorado are producing uh, less than one barrel. What does that mean? Why is that the case? Why are uneconomic, uneconomic wells allowed in the first place? Well, it turns out it is actually cheaper to allow uh, a potentially polluting, dirty, uneconomic well to continue to produce than it is to remediate, cap it properly, and, and stop the, the fugitive emissions that are occurring. So now that we know the truth, the truth will set us free, right? Uh, the opportunity now is to talk to our policymakers and tell them that if this is actually what Colorado looks like, then it's time to make sure that we're actually working on the biggest part of this problem, which are our low producing and uneconomic wells. Now, as a former legislator uh, who is not yet uh, out of his two year timeout, um, I can't lobby. I can educate, but I can't lobby. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking about what I'm doing at the state level because that's all I'm doing at the state level right now. But what's happening on the federal level? I'm gonna give you some good news and then I'm gonna give you some bad news and then um, you'll, you'll see what you wanna do with it. The good news is this, um, our congressional delegation is paying attention. They are listening. Um, even uh, some, some of uh, the folks that we had a tough time with at the state legislature, including our former governor, John Hickenlooper, understands that profits don't always equal prosperity for people. And 
one of the big things that we're talking about at the federal level is stopping non-competitive leasing. Um, for those of you who don't know what non-competitive leasing is, uh, imagine there's a certain number of parcels uh, across Bureau of Land Management land and that are up, up for lease. And you've got parcel A, parcel B, parcel C, parcel D. They get auctioned off for use and the auction prices are supposed to pay for the remediation and the cost of. Well, guess what? Our operators go out there and Exxon talks to BP, BP talks to extraction, extraction talks to somebody else and they say, you know, we could bid against each other. Or what we could do is if I, if I just bid on A, I promise I won't bid on B and you can go ahead and bid on B. And extraction, if you wanna go ahead and bid on B, um, don't bid on C because we're gonna let Exxon do that. So now we, the people are getting pennies on the dollar back on what, uh, what is rightfully ours. So um, John Hickenlooper actually wrote an op-ed supporting the end of non-competitive leasing. This was brought up actually um, in the Build Back Better bill. And our favorite or least favorite West Virginia Senator, uh, Joe Manchin, was not opposed to this. The bad news is this, Build Back Better is still not going anywhere. And so now the question is, can we salvage the pieces of the Build Back Better bill and put them into other pieces of legislation or put them as standalone pieces of legislation to see them pass? And so I, I wanted to give people a little bit of hope um, along with the cynicism. And, and the last thing that I wanted to share with you is what we're doing at a local level. You heard a little bit about Firestone. Um, you saw uh, with Andrew's presentation, um, some of the fugitive emissions that are happening up in Larimer County right now. Average everyday people who had nothing to do with oil and gas are standing up every single day. Uh, there's a woman uh, by the name of Suzanne who saw that oil and gas was coming into her community right by the golf course and the bike path in her neighborhood. She started a change.org petition that Logic saw. We called her up and said, hey, Suzanne, we saw your change.org thing. Do you need some help? And she goes, there's people that help with this? And we said, yeah, that's why we're here. Uh, we knocked on doors and we talked to people. We talked to people who are definitely not Democrats. Um, definitely not progressives, people who actually have worked in the industry um, or who have family members who are in the industry. And we said, we said, hey, this is going to come within 1,500 feet of your home. Well, that can't be the case. I've worked in the industry before. This, is, this happens somewhere far, far, you know, out in rural areas. Nope, it's actually going in front of your planning commission in two weeks. Uh, and if you want some tools, we're going to do a Zoom, tell you how you can advocate for yourselves if you're curious all of a sudden people start coming out of the woodwork. People who were either uninformed or misinformed by the oil and gas industry showed up, spoke truth to power, and the Firestone Planning Commission denied that permit. That's the power of, not of logic, but the power of local neighborhoods. Now that was appealed to the city council who overturned that denial and we have another shot now at the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission at the COGCC. And we have the ammunition now to be able to say, you know what? The one quasi-judicial, non-biased governmental um, wing responsible for looking at appropriate land use policy said no. This, to my knowledge, on February 16th will be the first time that the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission under the new rules relating to Senate Bill 181, we'll be able to take that input and say, you know what? We aren't about fostering the industry anymore. We are about regulating the industry. And because of Suzanne standing up, someone who had never done anything in politics in her life, never imagined she would be, uh, would probably be rightly embarrassed if I made her turn her camera on and do seated chair yoga, <laughs> um, is now a leader and an organizer, and she hates being called those things, but she is, and on February 16th, we will see whether or not the new rules, the new mission, and her organizing work can flip this script on its head. So 
Um, instead of instead of carrying on about this, we've got tons more work to be doing um, in the entire state of Colorado. But I wanted to share that one positive nugget of information and uh, look forward to your questions. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you for that story. We look forward to hearing what happens on the 16th. Um, uh, Mayor Joan Peck, would you like to give us a little update before we start our panel discussion? Sure, thank you. And thank everybody for attending. I, I'm always so impressed that there are so many people that are interested in the subject and want some action. And I, I enjoyed listening to Mike Foote and uh, Jonathan Singer. And I did read Mike Foote's um, paper, white paper to Sierra Club. Um, the one thing that is frustrating to me is the fact that, and, and on February 16th, I'm, I hope that this turns around on SB 181 because uh, city council in Longmont had a breakfast, Zoom breakfast with um, some of our, uh, two of our representatives, uh, let's see, who was it, Karen uh, and Tracy Burnett. And Karen, uh, what's her last name? Shoot, shoot me your last name, Mike. McCormick. McCormick. Yeah, for some reason I'm looking at Lynette and I want to say McLean and I thought, no, that's not right. It's an MC word. But um, I asked her because Tracy is having a lot of bills. She's writing a lot of bills that are going to be uh, coming out um, to be addressed. And I asked her, when you write these bills, Tracy, and they go to COGCC, who, what is the oversight to COGCC? What is the oversight to make sure that COGCC follows the bills that we have written, that the legislator puts through? Because I've watched Mike for years and Jonathan and Matt Jones struggling with this problem. And it's as though COGCC just acts as though nothing, nothing has changed. And Tracy told me both Karen and Tracy had no answer. They had no answer for the bills they're writing to make sure that those bills are followed. So I think that that is a, a huge loophole that uh, we, we have got to face. Uh, and I don't know how to do it, but maybe collectively we can figure it out. Um, but I, I love these series and we're on part four, which I'm thinking is one of the most important because it's really highlighting the need for all of these communities to support each other and work together with, we can speak with one voice and it's a bigger voice than each little community trying to just turn the tide on what's happening there. Um, and in the very first uh, comment, it was, uh, I like the fact that he called it the, uh, the untouchable giant. Gas and oil is the untouchable giant. So I want to make that untouchable giant accountable, accountable to us. Um, I know that Mike Foote tried to get a bill passed uh, for um, where the burden of proof lies when there is harm being done either to a community or to individuals and it is brought to court. It is taken the next step to get justice but the burden of proof falls up on the person, the city, the municipality to prove that they have been hurt. Mike's bill, and I wish it had passed, I'm hoping that someone else will take that and move with it. His bill said that it's up to the industry to prove that they did no harm. And that didn't go anywhere, but um, I think that that is really where we need to go because we are fighting a giant that has, never been accountable. So um, thanks everybody for coming and I hope that we can continue to work together or on a bigger scale, have a louder voice. So. Thank you, Mayor Joan Peck. And thanks for being here. And now I think we're ready to start uh, some of the questions that have been put in the chat box. Well, how do we they, have? Um, there are not many yet. You still have opportunity, please. Uh, type yours in if you have one. Well, I just want to say, wow, uh, the knowledge and the experience and wisdom of the panel speakers is phenomenal tonight. Thank you all for that. Um, 
the only question I see, both of them are kind of from, from Joan, the one she just touched on, which I think is probably paramount in this whole conversation, is that uh, the bill of, uh, or, or Mike's bill, and perhaps further or future or even current attempts at revisiting, placing the burden of proof on the industry. I, I think in most of the big business commercial uh, endeavors in our country, uh, that would make all the difference if we can flip the laws on, the, on their heads and, and have that pertain to all industries that are harming us. But if there's any comment, Mike, you can make on that, that'd be great. Otherwise, Joan had, um, beyond what has been made, uh, Joan had a question of how can we support Cultivando, which was kind of the focus of tonight, in their efforts, uh, which are so important and so poignant. Um, Michael, I'll just say really quick that, yeah, I appreciate the shout out about the, that bill um, from um, Mayor Joan Peck. Um, and it was one of many bills that, uh, that I uh, tried along with several other legislators that didn't quite make it past the finish line. Uh, but, you know, it was really an attempt to kind of uh, enshrine the precautionary principle. Um, and it, it, didn't, it didn't happen, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that it couldn't still be attempted. I mean, I think Joan definitely is correct when she talks about the imbalance of power and, um, we still face that. I, I think when it comes to something like implementing Senate Bill 181, the, one of the problems is that the industry has the resources and the people to continue to push and continue to monitor and continue to work the refs and to continue to try to influence the rules in a way that always works in their favor. And um, community members, environmental groups and others don't have anywhere close to those kinds of resources. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily absolve people of trying to do it. I just think that there's a real imbalance there that could certainly explain what's been happening. But uh, that doesn't mean it's irreversible. I think we need to recognize it and that, that it's happening and do whatever we can to really step up to the plate at this point. And that's why I'm glad that Jonathan talked about uh, some of the work that Logic is doing because I think that's part of the effort to rebalance and to, to bring the community's voice to the table. So it's not just the industry that's working the refs, so to speak, but also the communities working the refs too. And, uh, and, and see if we get to the place where 181 really is implemented the way it should be. So um, anyway, that's, that's all I had about that unless there's any other you know, questions about it. Um, well, I'd like to build on that a little bit, Mike, because uh, Jonathan mentioned logic, but I'm not sure people know what those letters stand for and what that group does. And you mentioned too, Jonathan, uh, having a toolbox, so to speak, for um, making change. I was very impressed with the Cultivando speakers in that film who were willing to step, up, step out of their comfort zone and address the issues. But uh, obviously, who do you address? And what is, what is their uh, comeback or, or non-comeback, I guess you should say. But um, if you could say a little more about the tools in your toolbox, that might make us all better advocates for uh, safety in this issue. Sure, no, I'm, I'm happy to. So LOGIC, LOGIC stands for League of Oil and Gas Impacted Coloradans. Whoa. <laughs> and yeah, which is why we use the short version of that, because that's a mouthful. Um, but but we liked it. So, I mean, this this is Logic's place um, on the spectrum of, of activists and, and, and advocacy. Um, we do everything from giving neighborhoods the tools to be able to advocate for themselves when oil and gas is encroaching on their neighborhoods and in their environment. Um, and, and it's old school. I mean, it literally is sitting down with folks and then figuring out where they want to go and what they want to do. And then going out, knocking on the doors, talking to people saying, this is when your decision makers are going to be making a decision. This is how we're going to do it. On top of that, we've also expanded into everything from, and this all always depends on fundraising. Um, you saw the, the story map project. That's a tool. That's a tool that anyone can use. Um, that shows an $8 billion unfunded liability in the state of Colorado. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, last but not least, uh, in, in addition to, to all of those things, I just wanted to say a special shout out and thank you to some of the folks from the Larimer Alliance who are here today. These, these are Larimer County organizers who have, uh, we've leaned on them and they've leaned on us to be able to um, step up at the Larimer County Commission um, hearings, as well as City of Fort Collins, where they're actually starting to finally turn a page on uh, making sure that they're doing the right kind of monitoring that should have been happening um, long ago and is now, you know, in Broomfield, Longmont and other places. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, another question, and I'm not sure who would address this, just jump in uh, any of the panel, but regarding air monitoring, what are the criteria for uh, generating data that the CDPHE will accept? Hmm. Who can jump on that? The criteria, what are the criteria, did you feel? Well, I mean, I, I think from the standpoint of what's immediate, people need to get involved in the permitting process that's going on right now. There are two permits that are coming up, one for one of the plants and one for the water, for the water permit. People ought to object to those permits being renewed under the present circumstances because they're not looking at health impacts, they're trying but they're, they're caught up in the Clean Air Act, which only has standards for six pollutants. And there are numerous other pollutants. We have to go after them on this, from the standpoint of public health. And 181 requires public health be protected. Now, if it doesn't, that's the biggest curveball ever ser served the public. If 181 doesn't protect us, that is a curveball. And if it doesn't, then we need to know that. And Mike's probably right, but they need to go back to the legislature and correct it. But they have two permits coming up at the APCD. And people have to take a strong, strong stand in supporting these things either have to be greatly corrected or you can't renew them. So Phil, I'm going to butt in here for a moment. Yeah, sure. are, are those the two Suncor permits you're speaking about? There's one Suncor air permit and one sort Suncor water permit. There's two permits. Do you, do you know the dates that they are going to be coming up for um, renewal? Not off the top, but they're they're published. I'll, I'll I'll see if I can get them for you. I'll I'll put them on the chat line or give them to Karen. Yeah, I, it's really important. I I don't think there's anything more in, because it's kind of a backwater over at APCD. I mean, a lot of attention has been given to COGCC. You know about oil and gas development, but it's really the air quality that the APC has. Or you know, it hasn't. It's in charge of air quality. Hmm. And not, not enough attention has been given to the APC and what they do. Now, they, you know, they, they, they cashiered the director recently because he wasn't doing any modeling at all. But it's still, you know, it's a pretty sleepy place, I'm, I'm sorry to say. And it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of effort to change it. So one of the reasons that I asked is that bringing communities together, working together, this, if we know the dates, this is going to happen. We can, we can work together to either write letters of testimonial or show up or, and I, I would really like to know what those dates are. So if you could get us that, that would be great. You've got two allies with the, in the city council in Commerce City, Susan Noble and Christy Douglas, who's just been elected. They would be overjoyed with support. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Jonathan, do you, did you have some, for the comments on this, I'll, I'll just I'll just say this very quickly. Um, Logic has a C4 wing um, that uh, does um, not just political advocacy, but we actually support candidates. The majority of our endorsed uh, city council candidates in Commerce City lost. Um, there are elections coming up, municipal elections coming up in April in Erie. If people aren't paying attention, um, we could see uh, a whole new slew of people get elected that don't care about the things that we're talking about. And then regardless of how we organize, we may not have the people in the seat of power that we need. Um, and last but not least, let's not forget Democrat, Republican, or if you're an unaffiliated, primaries are coming up in the summer. So it, now is the time to start asking the questions of your candidates and making sure they're A, educated on the issues and that they are gonna support the issues that you guys care about. So. Not here to be an advertisement for anyone, but that's coming up, guys. Keep your eyes peeled. So, Jonathan, I presume that uh, 
the oil and gas industry funds a lot of those candidates uh, campaigns that are trying to get elected on local level. Not uh, the ones that logic supports. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I know, I know, but I'm just saying it, that's obviously been a pattern. Yeah, but, and, and we will be seeing that uh, in Erie, I have no doubt. Yeah. Uh -huh. Andrew, what are your thoughts on, on this subject? Well, to circle back to your question, if I understand it correctly, about um, criteria for CDPHE to accept data, um, honestly, to be to be completely frank, the criteria is you have to be an employee of the CDPHE itself in order <laughs> for that data to be accepted by them. Um, and you know, just as some insight into that, I mean, I have at Earthworks, we use the exact same model of camera that the CDPHE uses to conduct uh, inspections. I, when I got my certification as an, o an optical gas imaging thermographer, there was an APCD employee who was also getting recertified. So we'd go through the same certification process. And yet when I submit videos that clearly show pollution occurring at oil and gas facilities in the state of Colorado, those videos do not count they, they're not considered evidence of pollution. They're not considered evidence of anything by the Air Pollution Control Division. And the only difference is between a video that I take and a video that they take is the person clicking record on the camera. So mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that's that's from my personal sort of experience, but I mean, it, this, this applies to citizen complaints. This applies to any sort of evidence that any of us gather about any sort of violations or pollution issues that may be ongoing at oil and gas facilities. Mm -hmm. As of right now, these agencies don't consider that they do not prioritize that citizen gathered third party evidence in the same way that they would as if their own staff were collecting it. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, but what Just, you're saying there is one of the reasons why a lot of us have gotten tired making statements before these commissions and things which are are just dismissed as community uh, extremist some, something or rather like that. So uh, one of my questions though is about testifying and is there still time to uh, sign up for this hearing about the Firestone situation and uh, at the COGCC in February 16th? Is that, are we too late to sign up for that? Or do you, does anybody know on this panel? I think the really the important thing is if you live in the Firestone area, I, I left my email in the chat for anyone info at coloradologic.org. Right. Really, um, th they're going to want to hear from impacted neighbors, not not folks that are, I mean, if you want to show up great, we're, we were all downwind and downstream from somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, but what they really want to hear from is they want to hear from those directly impacted, you know, residents. Mm -hmm. And they want to hear stories more than statistics or uh science so oh, to speak no well a little little from column a and a little from column b i mean i, I will be there in my capacity as an organizer but mm -hmm. uh but i think the important thing is is they they like i said they really do want to hear from from impacted residents mm -hmm. yeah one thing i'll say just to add to that is that the, um other new permits uh the new permits that were approved back in 2021 none of them had any kind of resident opposition now, that doesn't mean that there wasn't resident opposition. It just means that they either didn't know or chose not to show up in order to express that. So the, I, I, I know there's going to be some resident opposition to the Long Peak OGDP in particular. And so this will be kind of the first time that the commissioners are confronted with some real opposition to a plan. So that leaves me somewhat hopeful that we'll have uh, a different result in this case. Um, but uh, I just think that it's worth noting that, you know, whether it be just because there's been difficulties and people figuring out how to participate, mm -hmm. whether it's just that the residents don't care, either way, there just hasn't been any kind of feedback, negative feedback from residents on the other permits, at least in 2021. Hmm. I'm not sure how to, how, uh, Karen, how much time do we have? I know folks, uh, we've gone a little bit over. And yeah, we're we're over, but uh, Detlef has his hand up, and then um, Lynette's going to close. I think we're probably about at the end. Okay. Uh, you know, the mind can only absorb what the what the bottom can tolerate, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah what, what I wanted to add is, in the context of air permits or air emissions permits, there's a huge, huge dilemma that there really is no independent 
um, observations, verifications, check on these permits. And it's not even because nobody wants to, you cannot, you know, other than the operator themselves, nobody really knows how much is coming out of these stacks. Um, you know, even we can, we can measure as hard as we can possibly do with our stations that are half a mile away on the ground. These, these measurements will tell us, you know, what's in the air at that place near the ground. And it's important because, you know, that's where people live. But how much is coming out of these stacks? We, we cannot tell from those measurements. And nobody else is doing these measurements as far as I know. You know, you would need to have somebody climb up there with a ladder, put a, put a probe into the exhaust and measure it, you know, every, every minute, every hour throughout the year. And no, nobody can, nobody does. It'd be a very, very difficult measurement. It'd be very costly. So these, these emission estimates, they're based on self-reporting. They're just based on a very, very few snapshots that I would doubt reflect the changes in operations and in emissions throughout the day, day versus night, throughout the week, throughout the season, as you know, in any, any operational conditions change in the facility. I, I would have no idea how to really verify, check, you know, if what's in this permit, is it, is it right? Is it too much? Is it too low? We, we can't, and I'm not aware that anybody else does, and the state doesn't do it either. You know, it's, it's just guessing, hoping mm -hmm. these, these values mean something. I, I, I don't know. I can't tell you. I don't think you can find anybody who can really tell you how accurate these, these estimates are. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hoping that in our next webinar, we can uh, talk a little more about strategies. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, you listen to these stories enough on, and hear these uh, facts about implementation and you just yearn for a, a more dramatic or more newsworthy more inspiring way to participate in the change that needs to happen. So I'm hoping we can build on what we've heard tonight and get to that place where we feel creative and inspiring. And like we've got a workable, workable options. Yeah. But thank, thank you, you all. Yes. Yeah. Thank you to Judith and Michael for uh, handling our questions and answer section and to Mitzi and Karen for, uh, for, for, for the rest of the emceeing. My name is Lynette and our next event will focus on how we can coordinate with all of the environmental groups and leaders in our Northeast region. And uh, we do need to come together to take on this huge industry and th that's polluting our communities and adding to climate change. So we need to encourage our legislators and our regulatory agencies to hold the oil and gas companies accountable. And we can pass all the regulations we want but if they aren't being enforced, it doesn't matter how many requirements are in place. So our next event will be an event uh, to, pull, to pull our region together and to coordinate our efforts. So if you haven't signed up for, um, if you haven't signed up for this event or uh, uh, if you don't have, you know, you, if you want on our registration, um, please sign up on our website. Uh, let's see, I, th I have, I think I have it up here, uh, our website address. Um, we have a free website URL, so it's kind of a long one, but, um, on our website, we have our last three videos and we're going to put this one on. And this video is not being live streamed now, but, uh, Longmont public media will put it on, uh, in the next probably week or two, they're going to show it. And so their archive will have it. It's going to be on YouTube and it's going to be on our website. So you'll be able to share it and, um, you'll be able to look at, look at it again, if you'd like to. Um, I want to thank all of our uh, presenters. You did a great job. It was really interesting and informative. And thank you uh, to everybody who attended. We had about 44 people here and um, they stayed with us. So that thank you for, for hanging in here with us. I know it's a lot to uh, take in. Um, so there's some links in the chat box in the, in the um, chat box and uh, we'll post those on our website also. 
um, thank you to everybody. Please stay involved and please sign up on our website for any future events. We're, we, our, our next event, we don't know when or where, but probably in the next couple months we're going to have it. So, And it's going to be, hopefully, we're going to have it live and not virtual this time. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to all thank of our you. speakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Lynette, can you maybe turn on so that everybody could um, put yeah. things in the chat if they would like? I got a message from uh, Karen. Sure. Steve, something she'd like to put in there. There might be other people as well. Yep, there you go. You can, mm -hmm. anybody can, to, can uh, talk to anybody else now, so. Okay, great. Thank you guys. Thanks to everybody for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Have a good everyone. evening. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you, Karen. Thanks so much, Phil. It's good to see thank you again. Yeah, it's good to see thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Andrew. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. Yeah. <laughs> thank I you, think everybody. the last time I saw you was driving down to your house to uh, support Joe Salazar. <laughs> oh, you were that one. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that. Maybe that was a time. Yeah, well, I did. Judith and I drove down there and we got lost. It took us about two <laughs> hours. <laughs> yeah, but you showed up. Well, yeah, we did. Joe we would did. have been a lot better than the guy we got, I can tell you that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But don't give up. I mean, they, you know. We, we will post the recording, uh, Rick. We're going to post, we will post it. Okay. All right. It's been good seeing All right. you. Yeah. Thanks. Good night. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye.